Hello everyone and welcome to a brand new episode of Women of Arabia. Women of Arabia is a platform where we showcase women from all fields of life who with their sheer determination and passion they have created their dreams into reality. And today in conversation with us is an author, she is a businesswoman, she's a coach, entrepreneur, she is a presenter, all this. I'm not talking about five or six different women, I'm talking about one particular person. Welcome, Anna Roberts al -Khasiri. Thank you so much. Thank you for being part of Women of Arabia. I'm really excited to be here. Yeah, so like I introduced you, you are a presenter, of course, mm -hmm. and um, an author, coach, businesswoman, mm -hmm. Oxford student, which we'll get to in a while. Currently studying, yeah. <laughs> yes. And on top of all this, the most fulfilling thing, of course, being a mother. Mm -hmm. You're also a mother. And uh, being a mom myself, I think nothing will prepare you <laughs> for that particular factor in our life, right? No, the hands-on so training. Oh my yeah. God, yes. You are a fairly new mom. Yeah, they're, uh, I've got twin boys who are 16 months old. Yeah, not just one. She's got to handle like two of them <laughs> and leave one at a time is, is difficult. My God. So how has motherhood been? Let's start with that. Uh, motherhood has been quite an exciting adventure. Yeah. Uh, one that has certainly taught me a lot about myself, has brought my husband and I um, a lot closer together okay. and has definitely made me slow down and uh, reprioritize a few mm. things and made mm. me see... Um, some of my career aspirations a little bit differently. So okay. I've definitely reprioritized since I've had the boys. So when you say career, have you been a presenter all your life? So let's start with that. You're a presenter. Currently, yeah. you are hosting the morning show. The Morning March is on Pulse 95. On Pulse 95. And and so I started in radio accidentally um, oh, while I was okay. at university. So I've been in radio now for over well over a decade. Okay. And it's a medium that I love. Um, I've dabbled in TV as well. I've worked on digital platforms but radio is sort of where I always come back to and I love the power of voice yeah. the ability to connect with people and to be able to wake up every morning and do a job that I love with incredible people yeah. so I'm really excited to um, now be working I think this is probably the fifth or the sixth radio station internationally that I've worked for well, okay. and I've also been part of the team that started it up so that was really fulfilling as well all right and when you say you've been presenting have you been here all your life or where have you been? I was born in New Zealand, but I okay. grew up in the UAE. Okay. And so I went back to New Zealand for university and okay. then came back here uh, properly in 2010. So I've been here for around about 25 years or so. Okay. And, uh, you know, I, I love I love the UAE. It's where I call um, home for yes. myself and my family. So. Right. And what about presenting do you enjoy the most? You say radio, but then what about radio presenting do you enjoy the most? I think the cliche of radio presenters is that we love the sound of our own voices and I think you definitely need to have a certain aspect of confidence I'm right. not going to lie about yes. that being able to present to you know hundreds of thousands of people every single morning takes a certain amount of self-assurance but for me the power of the voice is unlike any other medium that we have to communicate and I love the ability to speak to somebody who's sitting on their own in a car or walking you know their dog around the block the ability to have that one-on-one -on -one connection with someone and to be able to tell a story with your voice yeah. our voice is our most powerful mechanism yes it's what we as babies use initially to cry to ask for help it's how we communicate um, in our most authentic self and I think with digital platforms and with the way that our uh, you know world is changing and evolving we have all of these new ways of connecting like whatsapp and email but when you bring it back to your voice that's mm. your most authentic way of communicating nothing tells a story with as much tone or True. intent modality and yes. everything like your voice does yeah. yeah yeah absolutely agree because I love radio and I like I've been telling you about that um and did you come back to UAE because you wanted to join uh the radio station here what brought you back well, to UAE? Uh, so I had actually graduated right uh, in the middle of the recession I graduated three months after <laughs> the global financial crisis so I um, describe it as being pushed off a cliff and being sort of asked to build wings on the way down because yeah. the corporate world wasn't there for me when I graduated when I sort of thought that I had ticked all the boxes. So what did you graduate in? So I did a communication degree I majored in radio broadcasting and I you know 
as like any young fresh graduate thought that there would be a job that I could just you know mm. walk into essentially there wasn't um, and definitely there wasn't anything in New Zealand and so I jumped on a one-way uh, flight and flew okay. to France okay not UAE all right <laughs> okay. and I worked on private motor yachts for two years so I worked for incredibly wealthy people cleaning toilets well, okay. yeah. <laughs> nothing makes you more humble than, you know, no. understanding that, yeah. you know, we are all human at the end of the day, yes. uh, that even you can be a multi-billionaire and still, you know, have uh, discussions with your wife about where the kids go to school, mm-hmm. about who hasn't eaten their vegetables for dinner, about uh, safety and security for your family. These types of human concerns and human um, emotions are inescapable, whatever level yeah. of wealth you are on. Certainly it makes life a little bit easier, sure. but, but yeah. you know, we are all human at the end of the day and that was a, a real sort of a light bulb moment that went off in my mind and something that stayed with me for the past you know decade or so mm-hmm. is that we are all human at the end of at the, the end day of the day yes and then from france to uae what was the journey like uh, so in 2010 my sister was living here and i okay. thought i'll see if i can work on some private motor yachts here and obviously mm-hmm. we know 2010 the world was sort of coming out of yeah, you exactly. know that dark time and at the same time i found through facebook a friend who was working in radio here okay. and so i said hey do you need some help with anything and they said yes definitely uh and so i you know jumped at the opportunity and two days later i was back working in radio again and then you came here and life changed in more ways than one yeah you know the uae has definitely given myself and my family my parents included a lot we moved here as a young family from new zealand in the 90s um Back then, the UAE was very, very different. And it gave myself and my siblings an international education, international experience, and the ability to think far bigger than we would have been surrounded by uh, in terms of people, places, and just the scale that things happen on Mm. in the UAE than we would have in New Zealand. So I'll eternally be grateful to my parents for that. Uh, I also, lo and behold, sat next to my husband when I was 12. Right. Because we were reading a post of that. (laughs) We were on the uh, school bus together. And so I actually met my husband at the age of uh, 12, funnily enough. Uh, It obviously uh, had no no idea of uh, of his potential or the impact (laughs) that he would have on my life at that age uh, when we we did work together when we were in our late 20s. So that Mm. was uh, very, very funny, but very uh, sort of Italian. Coincidence? You do believe in coincidences. Yeah, we do. It, it wasn't love at first sight. Coincidence, yes, but not love at first sight. Yeah, <laughs> all right. It was not love at first sight. But then you eventually you're here. You're married with twins, yeah. right? And has it always been radio and presenting that has been an interest? Because growing up, where you were, because I've I've read a bit about you, of course. You were not an extrovert. You were an introvert. Or... Yeah, and I think especially when you get put into a class uh, of communication students at university, yeah. you all of a sudden feel very alone when you're not the one that's you know wanting to be in the spotlight Mm. um but deep down inside i always knew that i had something special to give the world uh some unique point of view and i always had a deep desire and a sort of spark to be able to do something more to be able to do something bigger Mm. um i've I've never been a huge risk taker i've always been somebody that's been very logical and and very rational about my decisions but my father encouraged me to get into communication and i will forever be grateful because he obviously see my saw my ability at that stage Mm. to um connect with people okay and i love connecting with people one-on-one when i'm on stage i can be in front of a thousand people But for me, that's not my element. It's not where I feel that I can most successfully impact people. And so that's probably why I ended up getting into radio, because you can speak to one person, but essentially um, be speaking to so many people at the same time. And I love the intimacy of it. Yes, it is personal, but at the same time, it's not. There's something about radio that does that. And when you did communication and you decided to move on onto that particular path, like you said, you were an introvert. There are many people... Or, or for you, for instance, you, you mentioned something like you knew you had something to give to the world. Mm. There are many people who are lost, like mm. m- women, men, whatever, at any stage of their life. What do you suggest or what, what would be your advice to such people who are lost, but then they want to find their voice their, um, in life, you know, that particular thing that they ask, their aspect 
what they're looking for. Yeah. What would be your advice to them? I think, um, first of all, acknowledge that you're in that situation where mm. you sort of feel frustrated, but you can't pinpoint what you're frustrated about, where you feel these emotions of scrolling through Instagram and getting jealous about somebody else. We all have these yeah. sparks of emotion, the human emotion that we can't deny, and they're deep seated with something else. So once mm. you recognize that these emotions are you know, happening to you and you are feeling them, that's a great place to start because you mm. can then and start to ask why and and with that start to really clearly define your life what impact are the people that you're surrounding yourself with the events that you're taking yourself to the situations that you are putting yourself in what impact are they having on your life and um, I tell this story quite a bit which is the story of um, me sitting waiting to get my little Toyota Yaris serviced at the service station and I remember um, I've always been frugal, but I was always frustrated with the amount of money that I was earning, thinking that I had more potential, I had more value to give, and why wasn't I being, re being remunerated for it? Mm. And so my little Yaris was in getting serviced, and I sat there and I thought, okay, well, I'm not going to spend a was taxi. Was while you were here? or While I was here in Dubai. Okay. This was sort of 2013, 2014. Okay. And I started thinking... <sighs> This is so frustrating. I was, I was frustrated because I had to stay at the service station for three hours in order to get it serviced. I could have gotten a taxi, but I didn't have 40 dirhams to spend going home and then coming back. Um, I could sit at Costa Coffee, but again, I, you know, I didn't have any data on my phone. I didn't have anything to do. And all I had was a book and a pen and paper. And I started just instinctively putting a line down the middle of the A4 page and on the left hand side I started writing all of the things that I love to do, the things that I didn't even tell people that I love to do. I love to cook, I love finding new recipes, I love researching, um, I loved going out to dinners with great company but only mm. of two or three people, just really specific emotional experiences that I had had where I'd truly been really happy and in my element where I felt good about myself and I felt good around uh, about the people who I was around. And from that, I then started writing everything that I was frustrated with. I was frustrated with my lack of money. I was frustrated with the people that I would say yes to, to spend time with, but I really didn't want to spend time with them because I never felt like I would have energy after I'd speak to them. They were draining me yeah. of energy about the events that I would say, yes, I would go to, but in actual fact, I didn't want to be there and I'd be mm. counting down the seconds until I could make any excuse to go home. Mm. Part of it was my introversion coming out, but when you don't have the energy or the ability to balance it out with events or people that really give you energy and you know things that take it away from you, yes. you're always going to be drained. Yeah. So I very instinctively and very quickly filled up this A4 page, as you can imagine, of things that I really, really wanted to do and I love doing and I want more of in my life and things that really, really frustrated me. And from there, I started to get sort of a very clear picture of the next time somebody asked me, oh, do you want to come to this event? Instinctively, I would say, yes, absolutely. And then I would think, no, mm -hmm. no, I'm not going to. I'd love to catch up with you, but I'm not going to be able to make it to the event. To the event. And I started creating these boundaries around my life. And it's really been the foundation of where I've been able to get myself to, to today. Like they say, you are the average of the five people you hang out with. So true. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So you just, you suggest that you sit down and we acknowledge what the problem is and then try and figure out yeah. what, where to go from there. Right? Yeah. And, okay. and, you know, it's very cliche, I think, to offer somebody advice like the answers are all uh, within you or you have the power, or you have the strength. Because when you're in those moments and the mind can be so, so powerful, um, you know, you really honestly can't see a way out. Yeah. But instead of trying to create a solution, try and present the facts as they stand in front mm -hmm. of you. You know, what are you doing? Why are you doing it? And what would be a different option to do it if you okay. could or, or had something else to go to? Yeah. Right. And then I'm sure you've had many moments where you felt like nothing is working out. And, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> have you always in such moments been able to lift yourself up or have you been, because it's easier to go down the Yeah, completely. Hole, right? it, it's, it's, yes, it would be very easy to say, oh, you know, uh, uh, this, this too shall pass, the, take the good with the bad. But in actual fact, the people that have gotten me out of those situations the most have been the people that I surround myself with, mm. where I can openly acknowledge to them, I feel like I just can't win at this. I feel like I'm not making any progress with this. And they remind me of how far I've come. They remind me of my end goal, that it's not going to happen overnight. Mm. Um, and, and really having that grounding of the people around me to, to remind me 
okay, Anna, you're being a little bit, you know, unrealistic here. Yeah. You're being a little impatient. You have to take into account that you have two children and you have all of this other stuff going on. Because yeah. yes, you know, your timelines when you have children, they change. Yeah. It affects things. And right. being realistic about that um, has been very difficult for me to come to terms with because I'm, I want that instant yeah. reward and that yeah. instant gratification. Have you always been like that? Um, maybe it's getting worse as I'm getting older. I'm not, I'm not too sure. But um, I, I sort of, I guess when I found out I was pregnant, I felt like, I think there's a lot of people who initially think, oh, uh, I've got this countdown timer until I meet my baby. Mm -hmm. And I guess my initial thought, because I was so wrapped up in the business and so wrapped up in the work that I was doing was I have a countdown timer until my life will sort of cease. Yeah. And for me, that was a very, very uh, clear reality of what my future was holding was that I was mm. counting down until I gave birth and in order to feel like I could still have my life mean something, I needed to get as much done before the boys were born. Okay. Um, and I think there's a part of that that sort of continued on now that the boys, you know, have been around for, for 16 months. Yeah. Um, I'm slowly but surely coming to terms with that, but I'm also recognizing that the more that I, I talk about this with people, with fellow mums or with mums-to-be, the more people say, I feel like that as well. Yeah. And I don't feel like that conversation has, has been addressed in the mainstream yeah. media. Because um, I think as mothers and as parents, the expectation is, um, is of a different reality. Yeah, it is. Whatever you do, whatever you don't do, the guilt factor is always going to be there, I guess, as mothers, yeah, especially. I think, I think having twins, mm -hmm. I was always in a different kettle of fish to somebody carrying a single baby. Mm -hmm. um, you were always classed as higher risk. You've got a different sort of set of eyes looking on you and the two, you know, lives that you were carrying. So... I will always be grateful for that because I never really felt and I still don't feel like I'm a, a mumsy mum. Okay. You know, my boys were in nursery from the age of seven months because that was the right decision for our family. Yeah. Um, I know a lot of the reactions that I've had in person from, from people um, saying, how could you do that to yeah. your boys? And I, I was in nursery from a very young age. I had working parents. Um, and so for me, that was the right solution for our family. Yeah. I know that there are many other people who, who right. choose a different Yeah, a different but path. then there's nothing that's right or wrong, right? At the end of the day, it's like what no. suits you as a mother. And the mantra that got me through everything through, you know, we would have doctor's visits every two weeks. Mm. You know, having twins, it's a high-risk pregnancy. You need to take that special care. Um, and my mantra that sort of got me through everything was my body, my babies, my decisions. Yes. And owning that power, owning that control, and owning that narrative. Um, yes, I am a mother of twin boys, but I call them the boys. They're not twins. Yeah. Uh, I'm a twin myself, and I know how much language can affect how other people perceive you and how much I want my boys to have individual identities as they grow up. And even now, they're two very different people. Mm, so I'm, I'm very yeah hyper aware of that as well. Mm. And have you always been like that in terms of, you know, uh, positive affirmations and push, pulling yourself up from all situations. What's been your biggest fear? Um, I think that I have always been focused on the future and not necessarily mm. optimistic, but I've always been somebody who has very much enjoyed daydreaming about the future. Visualization. And visualization, like yeah, yeah, essentially without really realizing right. it. Yeah. Um, and I, I love, yeah, I love sort of that for telling or being able to daydream into what a potential could look like. And I think that that's been um, uh, one strength that I have that's been able to sort of take me through a lot of the hardships that I've gone through in my life. Mm -hmm. um, my biggest fear though, oh gosh, you know, I think I, I think I have so many, but I deal with them in, in different ways. My biggest fear um, at the minute is, is probably not being able to leave a legacy. Um, it's been a really big focus and I think my own sort of future and my own mortality has been hypened now that I have children and yeah. that worry is always with you of, of you know, what if the, the worst case scenario could happen and I think that worry stays with parents their entire yeah. life. I know my mum would probably say she still worries about me. Yeah. Um, but I think um, I think leaving, leaving a legacy in something positive that I can leave for my family and also for my boys to be able to, to Look learn. Up to and yeah, learn. To, yeah, to learn um, an example of a, a really powerful uh, couple of, of parents that they have in front of them and of the potential to be 
uh, a little girl from Manurewa in Auckland, New Zealand, that was shy and was able to, you know, communicate her vision and mm. and her story with the world. And if that can help one person, um, and if that can leave a lasting legacy for my boys to be able to to then carry that torch on, right. that, look that up for me, to as role models or and then carry it forward yeah, yeah yeah that that for me um you know is is something that i would love to be able to achieve and at the same time is probably you're know, really fearful of, of not being able to live up to that potential yeah is that what um i'm an a roberts.com when, when did you decide to set that and set up so, the business? So I started my business in 2015 and that was to really help entrepreneurs nail their message. I had met these incredible entrepreneurs who had left the corporate world, mm-hmm. you know, put all of their money and their savings and their time and effort mm-hmm. into a business. Mm-hmm. And then they would get in front of the microphone or in front of a TV camera and they would stall. Please. Yeah. And I saw them very clearly that we would have CEOs who would have massive PR budgets who would come in media trained and polished. But then you would have these entrepreneurs that just didn't have access to that. It was uh, resources and funds Mm. that they just couldn't invest into that aspect of the business. And so I thought, why isn't there affordable and accessible comms training for entrepreneurs? Why aren't people, you know, helping um, them with this? And I realized that everything was priced out of yep. out of their reach. So my business um, was a response to that. And the training okay. that I do in my digital platform um, on, on imanaroberts.com is really an answer to that. And then in 2016, I started to get a lot of calls from companies who wanted uh, public speaking training, mm. but specifically for women. Ah. So the men wouldn't be invited to these trainings. They would be locked away. We would be in a room strategizing and working together about, you know, using your voice and being able to prepare a speech or a presentation. And they would say, uh, the CEOs or the HR managers who were hiring me to give this presentation, they would say, it's only the women that need help with speaking up in meetings. And we want them to be able to have confidence because they lack confidence. And I think probably 2014, 2015, 2016, you know, we were probably at that stage in Mm. society and with the rhetoric where it was very much uh, about woman empowerment Empowerment. and so I would do these trainings meet incredible women who were highly capable and they would say two weeks later come back to me and say we loved your training we love the work that you do you taught us a lot but nothing's changed we would go into the meetings, we would speak up, we would do everything that you told us and everything that our bosses advised us to do. But then when we'd leave the meeting, we would get a male colleague say, you might wanna hold back next time and wait until you've got some one-on-one time with your manager and, and see you know see if you can get his ear then. That, that would be my advice. Or maybe don't share too many of your comments or maybe wait until it's your turn to speak. And all of a sudden I realized this isn't a female issue. This isn't even a male issue. This is a cultural issue. Yes. What business environments are we creating for ourselves? Mm. And how does the work that I do fit into all of that? Mm. So I started doing what I've always done. I started Googling it. And I said, why, why are we at this point in history? Why are we at this moment in time where women's empowerment is only a woman's issue? Yeah. If women have been invited to lean into the boardroom table, then we need to have something to say when we're there. But if the boardroom table is always going to be pulled away from us, Mm. then what's our solution to that? And I started, I had read Lean In by Sheryl Sandberg. Um, I was going to a Lean In circle. You know, I had all of the resources around me and I thought, I started to question this narrative. And in my Google search, I came across a few different theories and I loved, you know, sort of heavy research, um, academic based theories. And it was all about how capitalism had formed, uh, how exactly patriarchy had come along with it and where feminism was coming through the ranks as a sort of grassroots movement of of second, third wave wave feminism. And I started to examine all of these different ideas and started recognising the current capitalist system and our patriarchal system, in New Zealand we have a colonial patriarchal system, um, has really created the society and the business environment that we are in at at the present moment. And for me, the rationale has always been, don't try and go up and break the glass ceiling. Mm. You've got to come in through the roof. You know, we've got to have women creating their own businesses. We've got to have female board members and advisors and and be on committees that will help to 
have a, a top-down and a bottom-up initiative mm. because we know that it's going to take over 100 years in order for the gender pay gap to reduce you know, or to be eliminated entirely. Uh, we know that there are corporations out there who want to adopt things that millennials are calling for now of transparency, mm. of a more ethical you know, value chain. Um, we know that people are calling for businesses to be held in higher accountability and especially for their leaders to and so with that there's a body of research that really just set off a light bulb moment for uh, moment for me and it's a piece of research called the Athena Doctrine it's 63 64,000 people in 13 different countries where they were asked two separate questions okay. one was uh, from a list of values to separate them into masculine feminine or neutral values you know things like collaboration competition mm -hmm. Uh, transparency for example and so they got everybody to do this and then they asked the sort of second sample size out of all of these ideal values which ones would you want to see in a leader and then they corresponded the two and they saw that those that people listed as feminine values mm -hmm. were also what they wanted to see in an ideal leader right. so we know that these boardroom tactics of competition over collaboration yes have worked for men and yes have worked in the capitalist structure but things are changing capitalism mm. itself is changing it's getting a new identity yes. because people are holding it in a higher regard and so with this you have the feminine economy coming into play which holds um, uh, positions like uh, building a business for more than just profit for example mm. a lot of social entrepreneurship um, and also focusing on flexible working we don't right. have to be slaves to the desk yes, the, yeah. the nine to five workday was created in the Industrial Revolution over a hundred years ago. How, how do we create a workplace environment outside of the workplace even because we have technology now that is conducive to soon to be parents, mothers or fathers, that is conducive to that graduate that may want to work you know, from New Zealand or from Sri Lanka for a company right. here in Dubai. Yeah. And then how did you fit the whole thing and how did this how did you change your aspect to the training? So I recognized that I wasn't seeing any of the stories that I wanted to see about any of the businesses that I wanted to see. And so much like you were doing this type of work with you know this video that we're on now, I wanted to be able to see that in mainstream media mm. far more than just something for Women's Day or something that would pop up for any you know woman's agenda. Right. And so I started covering stories of women here in the UAE and abroad. And that really started this sort of cycle of how are women being portrayed in the media? Um, what narratives are we either amplifying or what narratives aren't being talked about? And then from there, I started to really bring together these ideas of feminism, of building a business, of um, being able to be uh, empowered and also giving them the tools to be able to empower other people. Mm -hmm. And that's where I, Anna Roberts, was sort of created. And then in 2017, I launched the Fair Detox as well. Yes. So it's sort of come one after another, very very organically just through my own passions and pursuits. Okay, so now that you've touched on the fear detox, <laughs> what exactly is the fear detox? So the fear detox uh, was initially just something that I created myself out of a lot of the sort of self-development work that I had done in my 20s. And I was at a place in my life when I had had the boys, they were weeks old. I wanted to be able to create something that I could use as a handbook, as a reference to go back to, to use some of the exercises and some of the sort of workshopping of ideas, but in a formal sort of structured environment. And I couldn't find anything out there. Okay. You get things for New Year's, you know, New Year, New You, and yeah, yeah. Um, the mindset reset and things like that. But I wanted something that I could just sort of pick up and, and take with me. And I wanted something that would help me navigate this new chapter in my life. What kind of businesswoman was I? What kind of mother was I going to be? and all of those questions were all based in fear would I still be able to keep my business running how was I going to be a mother as well and so the fear detox was me pouring my heart and soul into something that I created I typed it while I was breastfeeding my boys in New Zealand and it turned into this um, 64 page 11,000 word sort of manifesto mm. it's got a ton of spelling mistakes <laughs> It's not perfect, but okay. I wanted to put it out into the world to see if it could just help one other person. I had hundreds of women sign up in the first week and yeah. it's still available to download. And later on this year, it's going to be available um, on an online platform, print on demand, and you'll be able to purchase a physical or a digital copy and be able to go through small incremental changes that you can make in your life every day to address the fear that's really holding you back. And I mm. recognize that 
you know, like I was saying before, it's very cliche to say I have all the answers within me or I have all, all the strength and the capability. Sometimes you just need to formulate your yeah. ideas and have some structure and then be able to take those next steps. And fear has always been the one thing that's manifested itself in different ways in my life, be that, um, you know, saying no to certain things because I was afraid of how I might be perceived or... Um, Asking for help, for example, which yeah. is something which I have a problem with. Personally. Yeah, 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 that's a big one for, for many, many women or just yeah. being able to take the first step and to be able to say out loud, this is what I really want out mm -hmm. of life. Um, and being able to be really proud of your achievements. I think we're so fearful of being perceived as being egotistical or, um, you know, full of ourselves when really as women, we should applaud our achievements and, and really look at the great work that we're doing. Um, and that's one other thing that I'm really passionate about. You know, don't focus so much on what we're not doing right. Focus on what we are doing right instinctively as women. But is that just a women's problem, you feel? I think the media has a lot to answer for um, and I think society in general has fallen on this martyr complex of women um, who need some sort of help, some sort of leg up in order to be an ideal leader. Um, I think that there's a lot of talk around, you know, training for female empowerment and I was very much stuck in this for a long time. Mm. I, I am empowered to the nth degree, I have yeah. so much power within me, I could explode right now. I need access to be able to tell women that they are enough, that mm -hmm. they have the tools to be able to tell their story, that they have the ability to go after their dreams. We don't need to be empowered anymore. Yeah. We need to change the narrative. I think we need to move on from that. Yes, because I read somewhere, women are empowered. You just have to let them be. That's yeah. it, that's all you have to do. Yeah. You know, I think it's very, it's very easy. We could sit here for hours to probably yeah. say it would be this, I could blame it on yeah. media. You could say it'd be other women. And I think we've all had instances when other outside aspects have played an influence on our life or on our decisions. I think the, the way to heal and the way to move forward from all of that is to understand the, the power that we have within all of us, that we have the ability to be born into certain circumstances, but they don't have to define how we lead our life or, or how you know, we end up in, in this world. Um, and I also think that having that acknowledgement and having that self-appreciation can only benefit us even more. Mm -hmm. I think if we had more appreciation for ourselves as females, as life givers, mm -hmm. you know, I've, I've never felt more proud of myself to be able to walk into a boardroom after I had my two boys, mm -hmm. knowing that I brought life. Yes. I created life. Yes, that's right. And there is nothing that anyone no. can say or do that will take that away from no. me. Mm. And to know and to also see it happen, uh, that other people would tear down other women when they are life givers. Mm. Oh, I know. You've got to have some issues with yes. yourself to be able to oh, do yes. that, hey? Yeah. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. But then after you became a mother, is that when, um, have you seen that you've been focusing a bit more on probably moms who want to find a voice? And I think definitely uh, going through that narrative and living through that experience now in real time myself, I can see it. Um, I definitely recognize that I'm not... I'm not the the baking, you know, holistic, um, you know, sensory mum, mum. <laughs> I, I don't do that and that's okay because yeah, okay, yeah. I love my children. I make sure that they're happy. I make sure that they are cared for. Mm. Um, you know, I, I do things that, that I know are what I need to be doing for my family at that time and I know that there are other mums that are doing incredible yeah. work themselves. Um, but I also think that um, it's an environment where everybody has different learning curves and everybody, you know, learns in different ways. And so the way that I parent will be completely different to the way that you parent. And so being able to stand in in the way that I do things and being able to respect other people's decisions has definitely taught me a lot about myself and about how I interact and how I communicate with other people as well. Right. And do you do a lot of one-on-one -on -one coaching? And... I do. I've had to pull back a lot from that, which okay. is why I've got the digital platforms. Mm. It enables me to cater to mums who might only have that small space of time between seven and nine at night okay. to be able to work on themselves or work on their business. Um, and I've also moved a lot into product, um, you know, things like the Fair Detox, mm. for example, and some of the other books that I'm working on at the minute with research 
researchers mm -hmm. um, to be able to focus more on products rather than services because I just don't have the ability to be able to give my time. So whether that changes as the boys get older, um, who knows? You know, yeah. I, I never thought that I would be here now in 2019, four years after starting my business, right. you know, talking to you about this sort of stuff. So life always has That's magical true. ways. But in of... the middle of all this, yeah. the kids being 16 months, yeah. you decided to study. Yeah. <laughs> Oxford student. Now, what, what are you studying and what made you do that? So I'm doing a graduate diploma in global business at the Saeed okay. Business School. Um, my husband and I were talking about the possibility of me doing some sort of postgrad study. I've always loved researching and I've loved reading and I've never done any formal business qualifications. And so I wanted to be able to sort of have that seal of approval. Um, and I, I wanted to be in an academic environment again to be able to really test my knowledge and my experience. Yeah. And I wanted to do it for myself um, to, to really make sure that I wasn't... Um, uh, sort of losing my sense of intellect and my ability to uh, really share my knowledge and my expertise. I wanted to make sure that I did that while I was still young and while the boys were still young uh, because I knew as they got older that my you know commitments to them would be far more intensive and that I wanted to be there for them. And so um, with all of this combined, I found a an executive program where I would go four times a year to Oxford and I would have a 6,000 word thesis to write at the end of it. So it's not as comprehensive as an MBA, for example, no. and it's an executive program so it's, it's catered for somebody like me with dependents. And in fact, around 60% of us um, in the class are parents as well. A few with kids of a similar age to mine from backgrounds as diverse as working for the UN in New York to working for large defense contractors, working here in the GCC, uh, down in Australia as well. So there's a really diverse makeup of, of people, 40% female as well. You said you have to go four times in a yeah, so I'm, I'm gearing up to go on Sunday for oh, my wow. second module and I've got an exam to write next Wednesday. <laughs> wow, so. how do you find time for all this? I, going back to, you know, what I was saying initially, I love studying. Mm. I love um, learning about new environments and I love being able to gain information about different aspects. And so I sat down and, you know, it's, it's very easy again to say I make it work. Um, we don't go out to fancy dinners. Uh, we don't go out to the movies. We don't go out to a lot of birthday celebrations, you know, with friends and things like that. When we do catch up with people as a family, we do it with small groups or just in a family environment. Um, my husband and I actually have a date night um, coming up, which is sort of like a belated uh, anniversary dinner. Okay. Uh, we're actually meeting in Paris. Okay. afterwards because he travels extensively for his work mm. and um, I'm going to be just finishing up in Oxford and so we're, we've got a night in Paris where we do date night together and so um, you know that'll be the first, time, the first balancing. time this year that we'll get to, to sort of spend a night together oh, wow. um, okay. but that's the reality of our situation and we've prioritized our family and our you know our, our very small group of friends that we have around us um, along with the extensive work that we both do with me studying and with my business as well so it's not not ideal for everyone and it's not going to be our life forever um, it is our reality at the minute and I'm just trying to enjoy sort of every aspect of it as much oh, as I can great and you said you are a twin so I am a, a twin sister yeah. I have a sister yeah. yeah and is she the one who was in Dubai you she said? is she's still okay. in Dubai yeah all right okay yeah. and what about your parents how long have they been here and... uh, so my parents are retired back in Auckland now okay. uh, and so uh, they are just loving loving life as they should do in in their retirement and they sort of spend half the year up in the northern hemisphere I've got a brother in London mm -hmm. um, with his daughter and um, and his wife and so they spend a little bit of time in Europe and a little bit of time here do you see you be someone like that yeah. retired life is not something that I'm you, looking forward to you know I think as well as an expat here in the United Arab Emirates if I was in New Zealand you know I'd be contributing to a superannuation scheme and mm. things like that I am um, self-employed and contracted into the radio here and so mm. the reality of the situation is is that you know I, I don't have uh, some sort of corporate pension scheme or anything like that mm. Mm. so my reality is very different um, at the same time I do have a business that I'm creating value in and I hope to be able to either exit that or 
or sell it on or be able to license you know my company and my ip in in some sort of way and so i know that there will be that that legacy there and also that strategy because you know let's be honest if you are getting an investment for a business if you have some great idea those investors want their money back at the end of yeah. the day you need that exit strategy um, and I think it's very easy for a lot of entrepreneurs now, uh, especially if you're starting up in your, say, 40s or even 50s, to lose sight that you need to have that exit, especially as an expat here in the UAE. So for me, I don't think I'll ever stop working. Um, I want to be able to create value in, in my brand and in the work that I'm creating and in my products. And um, I don't know exactly how that's going to look like for the future, but for me, I need to make it work for my future. So I'm thinking very strategically about it. Okay. And what about your dad and mom, especially? Has been anyone who's been an entrepreneur or business? Yeah, yeah. my dad had a few sort of dabbles in, okay. in things. Um, and my parents have always, you know, been so supportive about all of so, my crazy ideas and, <laughs> and everything. Have you like had that. crazy ideas a lot when yeah, you were growing up? Yeah, you know, up? When I, I think back, I started a, a dance school for kids Ooh. when I was at university. Um, okay. Yeah, just sort of odd things like that where I never really thought of myself as entrepreneurial. I just thought of me following your doing what was necessary oh, okay. it wasn't even your yeah, passions it was okay i need to save up for oh. my trip this summer so i started the dance school i did that or i saw somebody else doing it and i thought okay there's a gap in the market for me yeah. I, I can fill it with my skill set um but have you always looked at it as something like you've mentioned right now gap mm -hmm. in the market and let's fill it or was it more to do with financial independence? Because you said you've had times when money was a crunch. Yeah, and I is think it's really important. I think it would be a little bit of both. Um, my family, uh, we, you know, we're a dual income household. My parents always worked while, um, you know, we were growing up and we would always budget as a family. Uh, my parents were always, you know, very strict on savings and we very much knew the value of money and the value that my parents um, would put into creating, you know, a life that was wonderful wonderful for my brother and sister and I. And so I sort of had that idea of money as I got older. I've never been great at math, but I've always wanted to get into, you know, business or doing something in terms of helping people and um, and offering people something that would elevate their lives. So whether that was dance or something in the creative fields or in radio and parting information onto them, or whether that was something, you know, like going into business on my own and doing comm strategy work for entrepreneurs. Um, it's always taken those different forms, but it's always had that common theme throughout it. And I'm no better at math now than I was when I started, <laughs> but I know how business works and I know how people work. And so I work to my strengths and everything else I outsource. Right. And um, why I mentioned financial independence is as women, we do have problem with, um, I don't know if it's financial security or we, we really don't know how to manage our finances. I don't think it's necessarily that we don't know how to manage our finances. Mm. I actually think that there are a lot of really savvy, intelligent women who just aren't paid enough. Um, mm. And I think that the gender pay gap is something that we can't see that is intangible because we don't have that transparency in our business practices at the minute. But I know for a fact that women are underpaid, yeah. uh, you know, across the board, I'd, I'd say in 90, if not 97 percent of cases. And that's not just here in the UAE. We know that's a reality around the world. We also know that mothers take on far more unpaid work than fathers. Mm -hmm. and, and that's culture and that's also society. So recognizing that um, I have an equal partner in life as well as with parenting was really important to me with my husband. Um, recognizing that we both work really hard and both of our careers mean um, you know equal sort of priority to our family meant that we outsourced we have nursery that we send the boys to we have home help we we work very hard um, for our family and, and that's the right solution for us and so I don't think again going back to my original discussion of um, talking to women about you know public speaking skills and things like that I don't think it's a lack of knowledge mm. I think that the fundamental <clears throat> foundations of patriarchy mm. and of capitalism have have put women on the back foot for over a hundred years now yeah. you know 
many longer, but then let's, let's just take a, a short piece of history mm. here. And I think with that, we need to recognize that we earn less than men. Um, I also want to recognize the fact that, that media market things very differently to women and the media rhetoric around gaining a husband for financial independence, um, about you know traditional patriarchal um, uh, ideals like going to your father, um, f- you know, for your hand in marriage, for example, or mm. being able to save up for uh, a ring and that all of our worth, you know, should be in how much somebody else spends on a diamond for us. Mm. I think a lot of these narratives need to be questioned because I think it um, causes some really deep seated insecurities in women. And, and I think society has played on that for too long. Too long. And sometimes I feel instead of going forward, sometimes I feel we're going backwards. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you know, because we can talk about the Women's March that's happened. We can talk about the amount of uh, women being voted into Senate or local government in America, for example. And then at the same time, USA Today will still say, well, she got a, a four carat ring or, yeah. you know, uh, and her, and had over a million dollars, you know, spent on her wedding. But but hang on, yeah. what's her potential in life, you know? Exactly. And, and I think we need to look at how much we are worth in, in a societal sense and how much we're worth to ourselves. And yes, I think sometimes I think like you mentioned when it's the Women's Day or when it's Mother's Day, there's something that they talk about. Like, yeah. you know, suddenly women empowerment and feminism and everything comes up. Yeah. And then um, you mentioned something about we not being paid equally. Like me, for instance, the previous job that I was in, I was paid at least 20% less than him. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I think we need to have that honest conversation that, um, you know, I'd love to see in the UAE, especially HRs, be far more transparent. I would love for companies, especially to take, you know, what's happening in other markets, mm. multinationals, um, to be able to take what's happening in other markets here into the UAE and have more transparency about hiring processes. And um, but isn't it better in UAE? I've heard it's better in terms of the government sectors, in terms of... You know, I think that there's, there's various realities for different mm. people um, but I think if we are able to take anything that's happening overseas and, and bring it here I think that transparency around you know what what people are actually being paid mm. for because um, I think that's a reality for many expats here in the UAE I think it's a reality for many many women and I think your story of being underpaid uh, is not you know very uh, different yeah, to, to my yeah. story and I know that there are thousands of other women who would be nodding their head right now and saying yeah, I've had exactly the same thing happen to me. And that frustration, if you are frustrated about it, look inside yourself, have a look at those values, have a look at your experience and your skill set. You have something to offer. And whether it's pairing up with another business and forming that uh, strategic advisory service, or whether it's going online and distributing your product or starting a side hustle, I truly believe that if we continue on and we know if we continue on as we are fighting that good fight from the grassroots ground movement up, we know it's going to take a hundred years to close that pay gap, come in through the roof, forget about breaking the glass ceiling and set up your own companies, put your money where your mouth is, back yourself, have that financial independence and close that pay gap, pay yourself what you are worth. Yeah. And then I've also seen the reality of the situation that I was in where I had reached great heights in my career but I knew that the corporate world, you know, wasn't going to be there for me. I, I knew that I had a higher earning potential and one that shouldn't just be valued on whatever hours I am in the office. I knew that I had greater experience. I knew that I had been in the workforce for longer and I knew that I contributed far more than a lot of the male colleagues yeah. who had replaced me, who um, had far less experience, far less qualifications, but were being paid more than me. Yeah. Um, and I knew that that was the reality of the situation. And so I I thought I can stay here and I can perpetuate this reality and this rhetoric or I can go out and I can do something on my own. So it was sort of a a double-edged sword. All right. And at that point when you decided to start, did you think about UAE as potential place that you would decide? Because it's also something, an online platform at the end of the day, right? Yeah. Yeah. And you are the service. Yes. 
Right. So did you ever think about any other place other than UAE? I or? think um, we all have those idyllic visions and dreams of, you yeah. know, sitting with our laptops, watching the sunset go down yes. on a beach, mm. uh, you know, somewhere in Asia. Right. Um, the reality is, is that I knew that my frustrations and um, everything that I was sort of dealing with here wouldn't change if I just moved to a different country, that those were within me and I needed to deal and make peace with them myself. And so going to a different country wasn't, wasn't, going to a different country was never not an option, but I knew it wouldn't be the solution Mm. that I was looking for. Um, And, you know, when you start up a business and you pour your heart and soul and all your gratuity and savings into it, it doesn't leave you a lot of money to travel either. (laughs) That's true. And so I wanted to harness the ability to have a digital platform to reach anybody in the world because I didn't think that anybody should be denied this type of training if they're an entrepreneur and they have, you know, something to be able to offer the world. Um, And I also wanted to free up some of my own time. I'm a mother. I I can't spend as much time on my business as I wanted to before I had kids. Mm. Um, and using technology is a great way to be able to kill two birds with one stone, essentially. Right. So what next for Anna Roberts? Oh, business wise, personal wise. So hopefully graduate from October, November okay. 2020. That's still a while away, but a work in progress. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to have, um, if not one, two of my books up online to international platforms at the end of, of the year. Um, and for me, I would, you know, I'd love to be able to work with uh, some of the bigger um, entities that are doing some really incredible work advocating for women that weren't born into privilege. Um, so, you know, entities like you and Women, for example, uh, working with some of the NGOs that we have here in the UAE. There's some incredible work coming out of Humanitarian City in Sharjah, especially with the Big Heart Foundation. Um, so I'd love to be working with some of those bigger entities, really being able to shine a light on some of the sort of um, impactful work that they're doing and the way in which financial literacy, financial acumen um, and access to financial resources are really giving women in underprivileged places the ability to have these conversations like you and I are having. Yeah. All right. Amazing. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure having you with us and all the best for your future and successes. Thank you. So we will find you on um, imannaroberts.com. Yeah, or I'm Anna Roberts on Instagram, on Instagram or any other platform. That's yeah. where you can find her, follow her. She's got, and also please do her fear detox. I'm planning to do that very soon. Yeah, so. it's still up for a little while for free and then it'll be paid at the end of this year. All right. So get on there. It's free right now. So get on there. Everyone loves do free. It. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. And this was another episode of Women of Arabia. We'll see you in the next one. Thank you.